The premier event for infection prevention and control is coming to San Antonio this June. APIC's annual conference brings you the latest research, innovative products, and practical knowledge to help you prevent infection. From inspiring keynotes to thought-provoking panel discussions, APIC 24 curates an extraordinary platform for knowledge exchange. Meet IPs from around the world who face the same daily challenges as you. If you work in infection prevention and control, you don't want to miss this event. Learn more and register to join us in person or virtually at annual.apic.org. You're listening to The Five Second Rule, brought to you by APIC, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. Together with our nearly 16,000 members, we strive to create a safer world through the prevention of infection. Join us while we talk to infection preventionists and other experts to learn the truth about some common myths related to the risk of infection and to get tips to keep yourself and the people around you safe from infection. Oh my God, Hannah, unbelievable. Today's episode is going to focus on highly infectious diseases and outbreaks, and we're actually going through that right now. Um, Today's episode of the Five Second Rule is being recorded on February 27th, 2020, and we are in the midst of an outbreak of COVID-19 or novel coronavirus. It is sort of a little crazy because just to backtrack a little bit, we were always going to have an episode on on highly infectious diseases and outbreaks. We were going to go back to hundreds of years ago thinking about the bubonic plague, smallpox, Spanish influenza, and then this kind of rolls around and we thought we have to shift what this episode is. So we're still going to touch on some of those historical outbreaks to give some context, but Today is is where we're really going to focus on that COVID-19 that everyone is hearing about, talking about what you really need to know about the disease, um, both as a member of the general public as well as a healthcare professional, because I'm sure you're seeing masks being worn everywhere. You're hearing wash your hands a lot. So we're going to go into those in a bit more detail. And we could not have better guests to speak to this. We have Sharon Van Aresdale, who is the program director of the Serious Communicable Diseases Unit at Emory University Hospital. She's the adjunct professor at the Nell Hodgson Woodruff School of Nursing, and she's the director of education for NETEC, which is the National Ebola Training and Education Center. So just to give some context also around NETEC is in addition to do to Ebola training, they also do numerous trainings on emerging pathogens as well. So it's very important that Sharon's on uh, the episode today. And then we also have Jessica Rosendi, who is the infection preventionist at Huntington Hospital. She's based in Pasadena, California. She's the president of the APIC Greater Los Angeles chapter and president-elect of the California APIC Coordinating Council. So Sharon and Jessica, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about this very timely topic. Thank you so much for having us. We have so much to cover. So um, I first want to ask Jessica, tell us exactly what we're talking about with COVID-19. It's a novel coronavirus just briefly, uh, who got it? Where did it start? What's happening with, with COVID-19 as of today? Yeah, so this outbreak started in Wuhan City, China. Um, initially, it was thought to have primarily come from folks that had visited a food market. Um, but as the case count has increased, we're seeing that there is person-to-person transmission. Over time, so since the end of December, beginning of January, we've seen case counts increase, and now um, we're seeing cases in over 30 countries, including in the United States, in particular in Illinois, Boston, and in California. Um, And This is a novel coronavirus, um, which is a really important distinction. We're familiar with coronaviruses, especially in the healthcare setting, Um, but this is a novel strain. And so we're learning a lot about it from the most recent cases. 
one important thing to know about this particular novel strain of coronavirus is how it spread. Um, so as mentioned, it spread from person to person through small droplets from nose or mouth um, with someone else that has COVID-19, and it's when another person coughs or exhales. So these droplets essentially can land on objects or surfaces that are around a person. So there are key measures that everybody should take into account in terms of prevention. And we'll discuss that more later, I'm sure. But one is hand washing, for example. Yeah, we're going to get to how to prevent and keep yourself safe. So we know it's a novel coronavirus. Coronaviruses are, there are a number of them out there. Some cause the common cold. Some of you may be uh, familiar with the SARS, that was also a coronavirus, correct, Sharon? That is correct. And there's another coronavirus that you may have heard of. It's the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. It's a, it's a type of coronavirus that I think a lot of us had on our radars um, because it does have a relatively high mortality rate, and it's been prevalent out there since uh, 2012. Okay, so so good news is that there is familiarity with this type of virus, but this is concerning this particular outbreak of COVID-19. Um, and Jessica started to say it, it started out in Wuhan, China. Talk to us about what the, um, who should be concerned? What is the current uh, Centers for Disease Control definition of who would be a person under investigation? Can you can you share what the latest is, Sharon? Yeah, absolutely. I would um, first off all, always encourage individuals to just validate the most current information um, at CDC. Um, but um, we've recently, or CDC has recently updated some of their guidance um, and has. Um, added on several countries uh, to uh, areas of concern. So currently the clinical feature, so if you have a fever or signs or symptoms of a lower, uh, excuse me, lower respiratory illness, and you are an individual like a healthcare worker who's had close contact with somebody either in the lab or caring for somebody in the last 14 days, you would be considered a person under investigation. So the, the next kind of level is if you have a fever and signs and symptoms of a lower respiratory illness, as well as travel history in the last 14 days to these specific countries identified, uh, then you would be considered a person under investigation. Um, and then the third tier is a fever with severe acute lower respiratory illness requiring hospitalization and without any alternative uh, diagnosis uh, and there's no source of exposure that has been identified at this point, then you would be considered a person under investigation and would then be tested. So that's some of the kind of testing criteria that we are uh, going on right now. And one more question for both Jessica and Sharon. Um, the testing is going directly to CDC or the Department of Health. So how does that work for our healthcare providers out there? They're aware that anybody that meets the criteria you just described, they're sending their test back to the CDC. Is that correct? So I'll clarify That's just correct. a little bit. Um, uh, in theory, yes. The first point of contact will be their health department, and whether that is their local jurisdiction or their state, that will be determined, again, based off of where they live, but they'll need to determine um, or call their health department. And then the health department will then help triage to confirm that the individual meets criteria. And then working with the CDC to get that testing, um, the, the diagnostics done at, at the CDC. The CDC is, um, at this point, the only location that is able to do confirmation testing. Um, I know that they are working with several state labs to try to get uh, labs up and running um, uh, where they can run uh, this type of testing as well. Now, Jessica, I want to get your thoughts um, specifically on some of the items that I've been seeing on the news regarding wearing masks and PPE supply issues. Being based in California, you are in a bit of a unique situation compared to other areas of the country. You have access um, to your different travel points. There was a recent um, community-based outbreak, or not outbreak, an individual that was identified and is currently under investigation um, without a known source. And one of the things that I'm, I'm sort of seeing everywhere is everyone is immediately putting on a mask. Um, I think I even saw Gwyneth Paltrow 
with a quote underneath her picture that said, <laughs> I've already been in this movie um, because she was in Contagion. And, mm-hmm. you know, I want to sort of wow. determine mm-hmm. whether or not that is a realistic requirement. I believe even on the Today Show, they had, um, you know, their their doctor that is on, their to- on the Today Show that notes don't worry about masks right now. The important thing is hand washing because we need the masks available for healthcare workers that are on the ground dealing with these cases. So want to get your thoughts on that. That is absolutely, that is absolutely correct. Um, certainly for the general public, the condition in which one would consider wearing a mask as if um, you know, they are, are coughing and if they're sick, um, then, and, and they're going to be out in public, in which case they probably shouldn't be. But definitely mask com- conservation is, is absolutely key. Um, in my hospital, and I know it's a conversation that's happening among other facilities too in Los Angeles is what do we do about mask shortages? How do we conserve our masks? Um, what, what do we do in this situation? So a couple of things. Um, if you're a healthcare worker, obviously wearing a mask when the patient meets certain criteria is key. Um, so specifically, there are um, particular units in my facility that have N95 masks that are stocked, um, and they know when to wear the mask and when not to. Um, another another point is a, a lot of patients, you may see um, many patients with these symptoms go through your emergency department, coming in through your emergency department. So, um, you know, being strategic about how you want to use masks in that setting as well. But certainly for the general public, I agree. There's, in, in fact, public health mentions this. It's not recommended to wear masks. Um, what is important, though, is appropriate respiratory etiquette and and being really, really strict about your hand hygiene. So make, making sure you are washing your hands often, making sure that you're covering your cough and you sneeze with a tissue or sneeze into your elbow, for example, avoiding um, touching your eyes and your nose and your mouth. Um, and, and then one of one of the other items is really avoiding contact with other sick people. Um, I at, at new employee orientation, one thing that I mention often is, look, I know you guys are overachievers, and I know that you guys love coming to work every day. But if you're a healthcare worker and you're sick, I beg you to please stay home. Um, so that's that's another factor to take into account too. And I think. A lot of the items that you just mentioned, not to go off on a tangent away from coronavirus for a moment, but all of the items for our listeners that Jessica just noted are things you should be doing anyway, Um, regardless of whether or not you are concerned about catching COVID-19 or the flu or the cold, proper hand hygiene, covering your cough and sneeze, even if you're coughing into your elbow, please don't cough into your hands, don't overly touch your face. I mean, those are orifices on your face that can just bring the disease even faster into your system. And don't come into contact with sick people, nor should you be around other people while you're sick. So while we're dealing with this outbreak, the general practices that are coming out are items that should stick with you all the time. Absolutely. And, you know, Sharon, you have a lot of experience in in your role at Tech. I mean, this outbreak, it's serious, it's concerning, um, but we've had recent outbreaks around the globe. Uh, Recall there was Zika, measles, Ebola, never mind some of the earlier ones that Hannah mentioned, you know, the 1918 influenza outbreak, bubonic plague, and I'm sure so much more. So Help the public understand, you know, what goes on with outbreaks and and who's mobilized, and especially for our infection preventionists, what are some key things they need to be thinking about, especially with emergency preparedness? Yeah, and I think I just want to echo what what Jessica is saying um, or said in that everyday good uh, hygiene, particular hand hygiene, is so critical because while we do know about some outbreaks currently happening, we know about Ebola in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, we know about loss of fever in 
uh, in Nigeria. We know about uh, COVID-19 happening in, in several countries. Um, it's this having situational awareness, but then always taking the right precautions. Um, and so what we really encourage uh, healthcare workers at any point of entry is to, one, that good uh, hygiene, like hand hygiene, can reduce the risk of many infections, including this novel coronavirus. And that is something that since 2014, I think most hospitals have implemented, is really good screening that occurs at these points of entry. So identifying people who are at risk for this infection, um, having them self, self-identify self with some clear signage that says, hey, do you have a cough or fever? Put on a mask. Because regardless of what you have, whether it is measles, whether it is the flu, whether it is coronavirus, regardless of what it is, we don't want them uh, you know, up and around um, spreading it. We want them to cover that. So we want people to be identified. We want um, them to isolate uh, these patients so they can receive proper care without you know, risking uh, further transmission, and then informing the appropriate authorities so that a diagnosis can be established or ruled out quickly. Uh, so those are things that, you know, since 2014, we've really been um, in pu- pushing, and these are things that will hopefully help prevent widespread um, of, of any disease. Now, one thing I want to touch on that we had briefly uh, mentioned at the beginning of the episode was in regards to when we look at the history of outbreaks and pandemics. And just to get some stats out there, when we think of, you know, those large historical outbreaks, we're, we're thinking the bubonic plague, which killed over 20 million individuals across across Europe. Spanish influenza, 20 to 50 million deaths in the early 20th century. Uh, polio, 3,000 deaths, and that was before the vaccine was announced. Then we've got smallpox, over three and a half million, going way back to AD 165, um, to put some history in perspective. And The reason I note all of these is that we have also had so many medical advancements since that time that I also want to acknowledge. So knowing that this is a novel strain of the coronavirus, um, as Sylvia noted, the coronavirus in itself is not brand new. We have MERS-CoV. We've had SARS. So is it appropriate to be at the level of concern that everyone is right now. Obviously, I think it merits the attention, but I also want to make sure that our listeners are are realistic or are not feeling so overwhelmed and terrified um, if it, you know, if we don't have all the information just yet. Right. We actually do have an episode. So for our listeners who want to go back and listen to episode four, which is about outbreaks, don't panic. We have some public health folks that talk to us a little bit about that. Um, But yeah, we don't want to we don't want to create fear, but just give people information so that they are armed with the best information to keep themselves safe. But as Hannah said, we've come a long way. We have vaccines among the most, if not the most important healthcare discovery ever. Uh, Certainly, I'd like to think better hygiene practices than in AD 79. Exactly. <laughs> um, and and actually, you know, we started to talk about masks, but we have personal protective equipment, PPE, um, that healthcare workers and others can use. And so we have a lot of tools. This is concerning, but we certainly want people to just be aware that um, professionals are working on it. And uh, yeah, don't panic. So, Jessica, let's start with you on sort of what your thoughts are in terms of um, the the fear that is being experienced across the country and across the world right now. I think I think it, it's it's normal to to be fearful. This is new. This is emerging. We we don't know a whole lot about about it at this point. We're learning as the situation evolves. So so that's valid. Um, but I think it's. It's important to also know that we are empowered. Um, we, we've been through these situations many, many times. I mean, you've got to remember, we just had Ebola in 2014. All of the emergency preparedness efforts that went into Ebola, um, that, that practice, um, that capacity building, uh, the strengthening of skill sets and, 
and awareness from from that 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 was just six years ago, um, which isn't that long ago. I think it depends on where you are, but certainly in the U.S., it's for us at this point, it's it's about going back to basics. Um, if you're a healthcare worker, you you ought to know what the person's under investigation definition is, um, and certainly be astute to your patients. And if you suspect that you know um, they meet certain criteria, it's important to talk about that with your team and an infection preventionist, and then probably with the local health department, of course. Um, it, things are under control, as we've discussed in the U.S. Um, it makes sense, but the the key is just really knowing that that we have the resources right now, that we that we are prepared, and that the situation is um, controlled right now. Well, let me jump in here because what I do think is is unique, and what we're hearing and seeing, and certainly what many of our infection preventionist members are uh, dealing with right now are concerns over the supply chain um, of of personal protective equipment and and other products and resources for healthcare because of exactly where this COVID-19 started, which is China. And so, Sharon, do you have any, any advice for our infection preventionist colleagues out there in terms of how they are managing that, the supply? Uh, and I know this probably came up during Ebola and other outbreaks in the past, but this is unique with China being at sort of, can I say it, ground zero and and the role that it plays in the economy and, and commerce. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is on the minds of a lot of people right now is, is how do I make sure that we can protect our healthcare workers that are, you know, going to be caring for these, um, for, for patients with COVID-19. Um, so again, in response to potential national shortages, We've seen a lot of institutions uh, start utilizing some PPE stewardship strategies. Um, strategies, excuse me. Um, one is uh, especially related to N95 use, and so limiting the um, N95 use to patients who really meet criteria for airborne isolation. And so, um, what this means is, you know, really assessing uh, the requests or the orders and confirming that patients actually need it. Um, you know, I think the and this is for for all patient populations, not necessarily specific to COVID-19. I think another strategy is limiting um, airborne isolation room entry. So, you know, if you work in in an academic center, you often see teams of individuals and healthcare providers going in to round on patients um, who perhaps are in respiratory isolation. This is probably not the time where you want to um, to have a large group of individuals going in to, you know, know, a patient who is on um, respiratory isolation. So, again, keeping that in mind. Um, there's also a lot of uh, guidance out there about um, N95 reuse. Uh, there's great education and guidance on when to reuse, when not to reuse, and I think that, you know, again, getting very strategic around how, how we do that. Um, so there, there are guidelines out there, and I will also say that the National Ebola Training and Education Center would like to, to put out some additional um, methods and strategies for what, what we're seeing across the country for PPE stewardship. Now, one thing I want to say before we close out the episode is I want to emphasize again that, you know, we are speaking at a certain moment in time right now of February 27th with this issue being novel. It's a new it's a new strain of the virus. Things are evolving on a daily basis. So understand that what we're recording today may change completely tomorrow or a week from now. So we definitely recommend that our listeners stay on top of those reliable sources, the cdc.gov, WHO. I know right on the CDC website, they have 2019 novel coronavirus and everything that you could think of, whether you are a member of the general public or you're a healthcare worker, they have numerous resources out there for you. Now I'm going to hand it over to to Sylvia um, because we typically do a what's bugging you section at the end of each episode, but it didn't seem appropriate this time around. So we thought we'd try something a little bit different. Yeah. And I just want to echo, we want to direct you to reputable sources. And as Hannah said, uh, for us, the best right now are the CDC, the World Health Organization. Certainly APIC on its main webpage is 
keeping up with things, redirecting folks to those reputable resources. But I want to ask Jessica first, um, if there's one thing that you want our listeners to take away from today's episode, what would it be? The one thing that I want our listeners to take away from this episode is that you have the resources and you have the power to gain the knowledge that you need to be more empowered and more informed. Um, You can take simple measures to make sure you're protecting yourself, your family, your colleagues, and your community. And one thing that we we talk about a lot in, in the healthcare environment is the importance of hand hygiene. Um, so for community members um, and healthcare workers included, that means remembering to use alcohol-based hand gel, for example, or remembering to wash your hands with soap and water and really not underestimating the importance of clean hands. Um, you're touching surfaces constantly. So just remembering to make sure you wash your hands on a frequent basis and certainly doing so after you cough and after you sneeze. It's also really important now because it's flu season. So let us not forget, you know, we're in the midst of respiratory viral season too. So I would say hand hygiene and, and protecting yourself and your family is probably one of the key factors to take away. Great. And how about you, Sharon? If there's one message, especially for our infection preventionists, what would it be? Yeah, I mean, I think Jessica hit all of those those top ones, the ones that that are really the takeaway messages um, that we want everybody to walk away with. I think the the other thing I would mention is, you know, in the last fifteen twenty minutes that we've all been uh, talking, I ask our viewers, how many times did you touch your face? How many times did you wipe your eye or rub your eye or rub your nose? Um, so get, having the situational awareness of of that hygiene and how to uh, maintain that good hand, um, hygiene, I think is just so incredibly important. And that we make sure that we are listening to science. Um, absolutely, this is an evolving situation, but we have to let science drive our practices. Um, and so just, I think, adhering uh, to the most current evidence that we have available um, and um, that's, that would be my takeaway. And then just a shameless, maybe maybe unshameless plug, um, is, is that NETAC.org also has some really great resources. We've, we've created a whole coronavirus page, COVID-19 page for our, for our viewers and anybody who, who needs resources. So we try to pull the best of the best into a single source so there's not too much. Um, folks aren't having to kind of hop from site to site. So, again, just wanted to kind of plug that as well. And that's N E. T-E-C dot org. Well, you heard it here, folks. Um, check out cdc.gov. And uh, shout out to our folks at the Infectious Disease Society of America who are also putting out weekly podcasts. And there's some great information there as well. Thanks, Sharon. And thanks, Jessica, for joining us today. And of course, as always, thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Hannah. Thanks for listening to The 5 Second Rule, produced by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology staff, including Hannah Andrews, Sylvia Covedo, and the APIC Communications Committee, in partnership with Human Factor. Audio tech is Blake Alfin.